Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy, and I am coming to you today from New York City. I was at Rhinebeck yesterday, so I have a little bit to share from that experience. But stick around because I have a sprinkling of other things that I want to share with you today. A fashion exhibition took place at the Metropolitan Museum recently. Before it closed, I had an opportunity to see in America an anthology of fashion. The Claire Potter dress on display from 1937 to 38. I noticed that the black linen dress with beige sleeves was mislabeled. The description referred to the sleeves as densely crocheted, but I alerted the museum to the fact that this wasn't crochet at all, it was knit. Perhaps they weren't familiar with how the garter stitch looked because they're more accustomed to seeing stockinette stitch, but we knitters know that garter stitch is not crochet. So I explained to them, in case they weren't familiar, that garter stitch is knit on both sides instead of knit on one side and purl on the other side. And in my message to them, I attached photos showing the difference. To that, I received a very polite reply. Dear Billy Elias, thank you so much for your note and interest in the Costume Institute. During the deinstall for the exhibition, we were able to pull this object to take a closer look. And indeed, you are correct that the sleeves are knit. The object had not been shown in many years, so this was a great opportunity to review the cataloging and update our records. Thank you again for writing. We appreciate you reaching out and are thrilled to hear that you enjoyed the exhibition. Once again, I'd like to offer a prize by doing a random selection of comments to this video. I have two copies of the Bonnie Isle hat that was the hat for Shetland Wool Week this year designed by Linda Shearer. You might remember seeing a picture of me with her and Hazel Tyndall. Um, anyway, I will once again do random drawing. So please comment anything you wanna ask me or anything you wanna know about Rhinebeck or Shetland. This will be a good opportunity for you to grab my attention. Also, it's not too early for me to mention that because I loved Edinburgh so much, I'm planning on organizing a tour next year of Edinburgh and Glasgow the week before Shetland Wool Week. And now that I know my way around the city and know how to get over to Glasgow and know how to get to Aberdeen, I really thought I could direct a group of people who are interested in going. Even if you're not going to Shetland Wool Week, please do join me in Edinburgh. If you think this is something of interest to you, drop me a private message, let me know, and I'll keep your name on file for when I get a little more specific information about it. Last month, when I interviewed Karen C.K. Ballard, she generously offered a prize to one of my viewers who commented on her video. So I have never done this before, but there is a random comment picker app that I'm going to show you as I'm going through it. So bear with me. Okay, so here's the site. And I have already loaded in the URL for that particular video. And I've answered their question, one plus five equals six. And now it's going to get the YouTube comments. And I think pressing start scrolls through all the people. And the winner is Wallace Clement, who we lovingly know as Dawn. So Dawn, this paper doll cutout will be coming your way. I'll send Karen your address. Congratulations. Of course, I wanna do the standard knitting podcast format of works in progress, finished objects, and acquisitions. The acquisitions have to do with Rhinebeck. So I have no finished objects this week, 
but I have some disasters. I have a real saga to share with you about for the rink or the links. The last time I showed it to you, the sweater was nearly completed. Both the sleeves were completely knit and the front and the back of the sweater were also completed and assembled. Unfortunately, when I went to slip the sweater over my head, put my arms through it and pull it over, it wasn't at all comfortable. It was a little bit tight across here. And I just thought so many months have gone into knitting this. And I think it's such a beautiful design. I love the yarn very much, John Arbin Knit by Numbers. I thought it would be a pity to not wear this sweater because of its ill fit. I don't know if I had mentioned before that the shoulders came out too far and I had tucked the fabric underneath. And I tried every trick in the book. I knit additional side panels to widen the whole thing. Now I feel like it's a patchwork quilt. It's a mess. So I started to pull back. I, I pulled back this side and I started to knit just in the solid color to see, can I get the right dimensions here? I'm really going crazy with this. I don't own a mannequin. I don't have the space for a mannequin. I don't really want to get involved with that. I am debating about whether to make some kind of a pattern for myself that will always fit. But, you know, every sweater that's knit with a different yarn and has a different gauge and different drape hangs differently and fits differently. So I don't really feel like there's a standard size pattern that's always going to work. A chunkier yarn, I'm going to want more ease. So I'm, I'm really at a crossroads. I'm trying to figure out what to do. What I know is that this sweater is going to be ripped back significantly. You see all these floats, that's the inside of the back. Those floats make this fabric not very stretchy as opposed to, you can see this stretches where there's no, no floats. There's no floats on the back of the solid red part, very stretchy. So it's another consideration, another factor. All I know is I'd rather have something that fits well and is beautiful, even if it takes me many more months, which it will. So I bring it out from time to time to work on it. It's going to stay in the active pile, but it's a work in progress. For my trip to Shetland recently, I packed this cone of lace weight yarn. It's probably a little thinner than lace weight from Color Mart. I think it's their NM2 over 30. And I began this scarf called Ibiza. It's not exactly Shetland lace, but it's equivalent to the complexity of Shetland lace. There are knit through the back loop, purl through the back loop, knit three stitches together. My preference is to knit on my chalgos. They're really slick and fast, but I found the tips not to be quite pointy enough. And I also found my left hand was straining a little, maybe because it was too slippery. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself because this is one of my acquisitions. So, you know what, let me come back to talking about this, um, but here's my progress on this scarf. I have a long way to go. This is about a month's worth of knitting. So it's slow going, it's very tedious. So because both of those projects are a little bit cumbersome, not so much fun, I really wanted to get back to knitting something that would be easy breezy and more fun for me because I don't want it to feel like work. I want it to feel like relaxation. So, while the rest of the world is knitting Stephen West's 
mystery knit along shawls, I decided on a Stephen West sweater, not for myself, because you know I'm a vintage lover, but for our son. I'll insert a picture of the pattern here. Stephen West describes it as a sweater that could use up a lot of odds and ends scraps. It's knit with two strands of fingering held together and you can mix and match. It could be two strands the same or it could be marled. So let me show you the colors that I'm using. And again, a recent acquisition, which we'll come back to. First of all, here was my swatch. He recommends swatching in his twisted rib motif. And there's another motif that he asked you to swatch, which is this little bit up at the top above this row of pearl bumps. I got gauge in both of them with the two different size needles that he recommends. So I didn't bother to go any further. You may recall that I knit some other things for my son using this Lang Super Sucks yarn. Here's how thin that is. I held it double before in making a scarf and mittens and a balaclava for him, but I had so much of it left over. A friend of mine had given me two skeins and I didn't think I had enough to knit the scarf. So I went ahead and I ordered from a company in Germany who luckily had the same dye lot as what my friend had gifted me. And I over ordered because I wanted to make sure that I could have more than enough to finish those three objects for my son. And I have so much left over that I thought I, I have enough to knit a sweater. So this is going to be the main color, if you will, of the sweater. But I wanted to add in some of my leftovers that I thought would complement it because as you saw in the picture, there's a, an opportunity for a lot of different additions. These two yarns by Quince & Co are leftovers from my Harlequin. The third color in the Harlequin was the color that's here, this teal color, which I don't think I like it harmonizing with these others, so I dropped that out, but I did add in this acid green. I have never used this, but this was some replacement yarn that was sent to me by a wool for a little dying mishap. Um, so I have not used this color, but here's where I'm at, but the pattern really requires even more. So I had also colors left over from my genie. Remember there were nine colors there. Now, not all of them are gonna work for a man. There's like a raspberry color that wouldn't harmonize with this and a peachy pink color. But these two colors I thought can work. So now you have all of this. But later on, when I show you my Rhinebeck acquisitions, you'll see an additional thing that I'm going to add in because I thought it needs a little bit of a punch for the triangles that go around the yoke. This is what I've knit so far. This is the collar. It's top down construction. What you're looking at here is a double thick collar. So this just rolls over onto the inside. And what happens is you knit this high, fold it in half, and then you pick up stitches from your cast on and go all the way around to secure the live stitches with the cast on stitches. And it makes a, a very clean and neat join. Eventually I'll come back, these stitches are still live. Eventually I'll come back and continue knitting down from this. But his pattern calls for a saddle shoulder that's comprised of 
welts and the welts are a melange of different colors. So I've started with a marl of a solid olive green, a little bit of the yellow and a little bit of the mint green. Here, it goes into the section of the Lang sock yarn where there's a lot of blue. And I kind of pulled out that whole section that's blue and marled that again with the same yellow and green that were in here. And now I've gone to the acid green, two strands of that instead of marling with, with another color. So these are three of the 13 welts that I'm gonna have. And at this point, I'm imagining that each of the welts will be a different color. It's really up to me. He's not specifying what colors you use where. These are things that I have not done before. I've never made welts. That's another interesting construction because you can see on the inside, it's very smooth. Although it's puckers of fabric, but the way in which it's done makes it certainly smooth and comfortable on the inside. So it's been challenging for me I haven't done something like this before. Um, I created my own workaround to try and make it easier for myself, which is I slid a slender needle through the row of stitches that I was going to knit onto instead of trying to individually pick them up. And that seemed to help me a bit. Um, if you've ever made welts, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, all 13 of these have to be constructed before I continue on. So this is also not something that's easy for me to take on the road with me because I have all those color colors jumbling, but I think it's going to be a fun knit. And once I get into the main body, it's just going to be plain sailing, smooth sailing. Yet another work in progress knit on a size six needle. So it's not my usual skinny stuff. It's working up quite a bit faster than what I'm accustomed to. Speaking of chunkier knitting, I have taken on a, an unusual project, shall we say. A friend of mine approached me. She knows I'm an avid knitter to ask me if I would be interested in completing a sweater that her elderly mother had begun. Her mother has developed macular degeneration and can no longer knit. So I said I would take a look at it and see if I could. Well, yesterday while I was at Rhinebeck, she dropped off this tote bag. There's a little plug for one of my local yarn shops, Annie and Company. Inside were an array of straight needles, some of them bent, mangled, as you can see. Um, curved, and I prefer to knit with circulars, my chow goos, but it sort of gave me an idea of what size range I was in. Also in the bag were all of these papers. So I had to figure out, is it this pattern or is it this pattern? So I started reading through the instructions and comparing it to the already done knitting. The back of the sweater she had already completed in addition to one of the fronts, let me show you up close this interesting texture. I can't quite figure out what this is. It seems like a very narrow piece of shoulder. Usually a shoulder would be three or four inches wide. And this is, as you can see, nowhere near that. So I'm not sure how this is going to be until I actually assemble it but she had done only one front and the back. The gorgeous yarn is Madeline Tosh, bulky. 
superwash merino wool that gives 12 to 14 stitches to four inches. They recommend a size nine or 10 needle. So I started with an eight for the ribbing when I began the sleeve and I wasn't getting the same gauge in my ribbing as she had gotten in hers. So I went down and I went down and down until I got to size six for the ribbing. So my gauge matches to her gauge and the sleeve cap, the stockinette section is knit on a size eight needle. And again, I match her gauge there as well. Now, this texture is not as soft, is not as soft as the texture of this. So I'm wondering if she already wet blocked the back because the yarn feels much softer, much lovelier. The color's gorgeous. It's a delight to knit with. So I think I have to include this in my works in progress, but it's knitting up at, at that gauge super fast compared to the kinds of things, you know, this crazy person usually knits. Okay, the saga of Rhinebeck. We got up at 4.45 in the morning. Recently, I heard that a friend of mine got stuck in the New York City subway because of some police activity. And if you're not in the station, they can't open the doors, they won't let people off. I thought we can't really risk taking the subway to Penn Station to catch our Amtrak train. Because if we miss that train, the tickets are not easily refunded, we would totally miss Rhinebeck. We'd already paid for the Amtrak tickets and we'd already paid for our Rhinebeck tickets. So I didn't want to leave this to chance. The only way that I knew that I would definitely get to Penn Station in time for my 715 train was to hoof it. So it was still dark out. My husband and I had a lovely moonlit <laughs> stroll to the new Moynihan train hall. Moynihan train hall isn't brand new. It's at least a couple of years old, but I had never had occasion to really go into it because I don't take Amtrak trains. I haven't been on an Amtrak in probably 15 or 20 years. It's one of the ways to get from New York City to Rhinebeck. We didn't get off to that great a start. The line of people to get onto the train was like down the block, around the corner. It was probably two city blocks long, the line of people. Every seat was sold. So we were lucky, my husband and I, to get two seats together. But although we had gotten up early and done this early morning walk to the station, we sat on the train for about 40 minutes. The train never pulled out of the station. They had some track work. So that was annoying because we were only going for the day. We wanted to maximize our time there. We took the 715 train that was gonna get us there at 858. The fare opens at nine. So it's like five minute taxi ride. Well, that's another part of this adventure that wasn't so pleasant, taxis. I had called a variety of taxi companies, finally found one that would take my reservation. I confirmed with the guy and I confirmed our return trip at the end of the day back to the station. Two days before the event, the guy calls me and says, I'm very sorry, I have to cancel your reservation. I tried to get you with another company, but they're also booked. I'm short staffed that day. P.S. We don't have a taxi. Neither do a lot of other people. On the Ravelry Rhinebeck group, I saw a lot of people saying, I'm arriving on this train. Does anybody have a cab that they'd be willing to share? So I called more cab companies and I was told the taxis, 
don't worry, ma'am, the taxis are going to be shuttling back and forth. So as soon as they drop a group of people off, they'll come right back to the station and get more people. So, okay, we put up with that, but I wanted to make sure at the end of the day, when everybody was trying to get back to the station, that we wouldn't be left out in the cold. So I took the guy's card and I said, you know, can I call you later on? He's like, yeah, okay. I call. I'm not working. Uh, there'll be taxis there. Well, there weren't any taxis at the Mulberry Street entrance where he had dropped us off. So at the end of the day, we were really in a bit of a panic about getting back to the train station. I just started walking up to strangers and asking them, do you have room in your car? Would you take two people to the station? It's only five minutes away. A lot of these people are not from the area. So they really don't know the territory and the train station could be half an hour away, but it turns out it's very nearby. Nobody really wanted to take us. Maybe they thought we were ex-murderers or something, but we finally found this lovely young woman and her mother, Wendy. I forget her name, but maybe they're watching. Maybe they can tell me their names again. She's from Oregon. Her mother lives in Northern California and they were so gracious. Of course, we'll take you. So whew, we got to the train station in plenty of time. Okay, back at the fair. Let me show you a map of Rhinebeck in case you ever go. Each of these rectangles represents a building. They're kind of like big barns. And some of those barns actually have livestock in them. There were a lot of sheep on display, but there's also a wide array of vendors. Not only people selling yarn, but people selling spinning wheels and spindles and fleece and sheepskin rugs and felted hats, felted little animals, all sorts of handmade things, soap, hand lotions made with lanolin from sheep, and every different type of yarn. Those of you who have been watching my show for the last two years know, because I've mentioned it often, I live in a small apartment, I have no space, nor do I have the interest in stashing yarn. So I really wasn't going to Rhinebeck like many people anticipating buying huge quantities of yarn, especially because I have all of these projects on the go right now. I don't wanna have stuff hanging around that I'm not gonna be using for another year. So I was very, very, disciplined in my approach to what I was looking at. One of the first booths that I came to did have something that I thought I might acquire. And I had seen these things before at Vogue Knitting Live, but I really didn't have a need for them at that point. I felt more like I had a need for them now. And those are the needles that I had shown you before that immediately on the train ride home, I started to knit with. It's a company called Indian Lake Artisans and they are hexagonal in shape. They're meant to be ergonomic, causing less strain on your hand and supposedly creating neater stitches. I don't really have that problem, but this needle I feel is quite a bit pointier than my chow goos. Let me grab my chow goo to show you. I think that you can see the difference in the, the point. These are made of maple, which they tell me is one of the sturdiest woods, not likely to splinter at all or break. Um, the company does have a guarantee. So, it seems to be a very high quality product. I'm reasonably happy with how they feel. It takes a little getting used to um, since I've been knitting with other types of needles. They make other size needles in other woods. They make them in cherry and they also make them in walnut. So there are different colors of wood. Anyway, they're offering my viewers a discount 
all you have to do is use this coupon code, NYSW22. And that's only good until October 31st. I'm not sure how deep the discount is. It might be something like 10%. But if you're somebody who is experiencing any kind of hand strain, you might want to take a look at these. Oh, another thing is the needle swivels. These are not interchangeable, but I think it sort of moves along with you. Some other needles, you know, if you tighten them with the key, they sometimes come loose and fall out because they do want to keep twisting. This allows them to twist with you. My next acquisition is this unbranded, unnamed yarn. A dollar for this mini. The woman had hundreds and hundreds of these in big vats. She and her husband buy, I guess, like odd lots from mills, kind of like my Color Mart thing. So it's catch as catch can. Some people were buying 20, 30 of these like to assemble a sweater's quantity. And she had different weights, all kinds of different colors. But I specifically bought this because I thought it would meld into that Stephen West sweater. So let me grab those yarns again and show you how that's all gonna look together. Remember the triangles that go around the yoke? I wanted some kind of color that would be really standing out, standing apart from the rest. This is good, but I thought to go in a completely different direction, dark, contrasting with everything else. It's not a solid color. It's got like some variegation to it. I think it's gonna be interesting. We'll see. My third acquisition, I know, I know, there's no project in mind. This is a big Billy no-no, but I could not resist this color. It's chenille. It's got a velour finish. It seems like it's a little bit of a flat tape. It's not rounded, but thin. The company's called Artisanal Yarns. It's really a no brand label. Same people that I got that little dollar mini from. 200 yards. It says the birth date was October 12th, 2018. These people buy stuff on huge cones and then they wind off select quantities and then they just throw this little label around it. The price could not be beat. And I thought with 400 yards, these were the only two that they had in this color. But I thought with that quantity, I'll do something, even if it's just a little camisole. And I don't know if I would make a hat, maybe gloves. I don't know, just the, the color just really, really totally grabbed me. So that's all I bought. Um, I thought that was very well behaved of me. Don't you agree? But there was more to Rhinebeck than the shopping. There was a whole barn filled with sheep in individual pens, lots of different breeds of sheep. And there were some breeds that I had never heard of before. So I brought you to see a little curly sample. That's Teeswater. There were representatives of the American Teeswater Sheep Association there. Look at those curls. It's a heritage breed and it's an American breed, large long wool. Here's a picture of one. I also had an opportunity to meet this man from May Apple Hill Farm where they raise Coopworth sheep. His sheep really stopped me in my tracks because he had this poster on the front of his pen, which indicated that a dress, a beautiful dress had been made out of yarn from his sheep. 
So I had a, a brief little interview with him, which I'll insert here. The dress was worn at the famous Met Gala, which I think is the first Monday in May every year on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You've probably seen it on the cover of your favorite fashion magazine. It's always a big deal in entertainment news because celebrities come out in these outlandish outfits, hiding very little. But the president of the Met was escorted by his wife who was wearing this very unusual gown. And there's a picture of it in the flyer. So my name is Nick Booter, and I'm with May Apple Hill Farm in New Milford, Connecticut, and we raise Coopworth sheep. And we met Katya sort of by chance, and she came to our farm one day and was really passionate about sheep. And she decided that as a fashion designer, she was going to work primarily with wool. So she was a student at the time in college, and she bought wool from us, and she, she, um, she's like a very gifted fashion designer and takes sort of knitting and weaving to a level way beyond where the average person is. And she made these these dresses as actually, she made several other dresses, but she made these two for the wife of the president of the Met. It's and, completely um, exquisite. And they're just amazing. I remember seeing <laughs> so, it. Yeah. I also spoke at length to a very charming man named Robert David Sweeney, who raises traditional English South Downs. How cute is that? They're little, they're very short, stocky, compact sheep. And he spent a great deal of time chatting with me and my husband about how unusual the breed is. He's really trying very hard to retain the integrity of the breed. He doesn't sell a lot of yarn, but the few examples of scarves and hats that he had on display that had been knit with his yarn made me absolutely fall in love with it. It's soft, not cashmere soft, but after the rustic wools in Scotland, this was refreshing to feel something that looks rustic, but has a very nice, gentle hand. He described the wool as having a very short fiber, which tends to make it nice and soft. It doesn't have good stitch definition, but that was part of the loveliness of it. Even the stitches were subtle. So the subtleness of the feel with the subtleness of the stitch to me seemed a winning combination. Unfortunately, he doesn't have a lot of white. He has almost no white. It's more this beigey, very natural color. And that's what he's been breeding of late. Still, I encourage you to take a look at Laughing Stock. His family has been in that area for 400 years. He must have come over on the Mayflower. I don't know. Anyway, very lovely man, happy to meet him. And he gave me a free pattern for his Sweeney Beanie. If you're interested, I will type it up and uh, provide it to you. I do wanna tell you about just a, a handful of yarn vendors who I encountered. Springfield Farm, their website is springfieldfarm.com was there selling cashmere, beautiful cashmere. I didn't find the prices to be that outrageous. So I encourage you to take a look. They had lovely colors. I just wasn't in the market for any cashmere right now, but I made a note of them in case I ever do want cashmere. I thought theirs was lovely. Um, I also met the people from Autumn House Fiber Works. They had a hodgepodge of things. I think their inventory is constantly changing. Autumn House Fiberworks is offering a 10% discount if you put Fiberworks 10. 
as your code online. But very unusual things, unusual textures, unusual color combinations, um, not your run of the mill marled or um, speckled or tweed, but interesting. Another really interesting one was Yellow Dog Farm, yellowdogfarmvt.com. Her colors were out of this world and she dyes the same color on each of a variety of different bases. So she had a boucle, she had a mohair. It seems like she will do custom orders because she kept saying like, if I don't have what you're looking for, let me know. She had really pretty colors. And I just love the idea that you could get several different textures of yarn in the same color way. I haven't seen a lot of people doing that. Because I am so into color, Morehouse Farm is another one that I gravitated to. I had known about them, but hadn't really had an opportunity to squeeze their yarn before. Some of the bases were really exceptionally soft and their website is Morehouse Farm, M-O-R-E-H-O-U-S-E farm.com. The last company I wanted to mention to you is called Solitude Wool. They had all different breeds. You know, I'm so used to seeing Merino, Merino, Merino. When you start to see these other breeds like Border Lester, Tunis, Montedale, Romney. And she took time to explain each of the yarns. I found most of them to be a little too rustic for my taste, but there's reasons for people to use these different textures. So if you're that knitter, I encourage you to go look at their website. They have really good description about the different breeds and so forth there. So take a look. Okay, that's it for this week. I hope everybody is staying safe and knitting happily. I hope you have fewer works in progress and more finished objects than I do. See you next week.